Okay, we, uh, let's get out of the way. Uh, welcome everybody, and um, this is our usual weekly uh, linguistics department seminar. And we're very uh, happy today to have one of our very own to, um, to be the speaker. Um, just realized a few minutes ago that um, it's our 13th anniversary this year, Aisha. <laughs> so Aisha came to the SOAS um, in 2005 to do her PhD. Um, Masters in PhD. <laughs> Masters and then PhD. Masters and then the PhD, so postgraduate study, um, which she finished in two thousand. She finished the, stu the postgraduate studies in about two thousand ten, um, and her research topic was um, a study of Berber languages from North Africa. Um, SOAS has actually been a centre for the study of Berber for quite a number of years, uh, actually going back way into prehistory. You, you probably know the. Uh, it was. Um, <laughs> Are you looking at me? I'm looking at you. What was it? Yes, what was his name? You were the, you were the fountain of all memory. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the. the, the, the yeah. What? Jim? Jim? Yeah. Jim. 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 <laughs> yeah, he was a Berber. I mean. Exactly, we had quite a flourishing uh, area. He was a big specialist in it. And then um, it went quiet for a little while. And then we've had, uh, we've had Aisha here and Simone Maui, uh, Lamine Soak. So um, it's wonderful to see that this group of, of Afroasiatic languages is, is well represented. Um, so uh, Aisha has been on, is a permanent member of staff and has been here since. Uh, in that capacity for since 2012, and I know a number of you have already uh, had classes with her or taken classes with her. It's a real stalwart for the teaching of particularly syntax and also introductory linguistics. Um, so today she's going to be talking about her research um, and with a focus on um, the roles of motion verbs in um, expressing discourse functions with a focus on her favorite language. Yes. Which is uh, uh, Berber again. So over to you, Aisha. Um, thank you. Yes, so I'm going to be uh, talking about a particular uh, grammaticalization path, one that takes motion verbs and uh, transforms um, them into markers of uh, narrative um, discourse. Uh, and I'm going to be focusing on the verb Ural in Tagbailit, which is a Berber language. And like all Berber languages, it's an Afroasiatic language. And this one is uh, spoken in northeastern Algeria. So the verb Ural in Tagbailit canonically uh, means to return or to go back, as illustrated in one. Uh, and in some context, it can also uh, have a sequential meaning, or it is translated by the speakers with a sequential meaning. So she cut his navel, his navel string and then she uh, bondaged uh, the boy. So the verb oral is translated as and, um, and then. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about that and this is really much research in progress. So there are, I have a lot of questions and uh, not uh, a lot of definite answers uh, yet. And everything that I'm going to be saying is based on uh, studies of my narratives. I haven't done elicitation uh, on the discourse function of this verb. So it's just based on the narratives. Um, so my aims today are going to show that uh, Ural has grammaticalized into a narrative discourse marker. Uh, so a type of discourse marker whose main functions are to link sequential units of discourse in narratives, uh, but also to show uh, a speaker's opinion on how these units of discourse relate to each other, uh, and particularly to mark uh, new units of discourse or uh, units of discourse that contrast with previous units of discourse. And I will suggest a possible uh, grammaticalization pathway for the verb in Tagbailit, which has not been uh, reported before, uh, well, as far as I know. And this uh, pathway, I'm going to say, is that the verb uh, encodes initially motion 
and then gra has grammaticalized into a marker of change of state, and then from the change of state meaning or the change of state construction, it has further grammaticalized into a marker of a narrative discourse. So my talk is organized as uh, follows. I will be uh, giving a definition, very briefly a definition of grammaticalization. I'll describe some of the main characteristics of grammaticalization. Then I will talk about the grammaticalization or the development of discourse markers. Um, I will give a very brief, again, typological overview of uh, the motion to discourse marking a grammaticalization path. And then I'll focus on the verb oral in Tagbailitz. I'll give an overview of the verb. I'll discuss the discourse and morphosyntactic properties of grammaticized uh, oral. And then I'll talk about some possible uh, source constructions. Uh, so grammaticalization is defined by uh, Hopper and Trogot and Trogot in various places as the process whereby lexical material in highly constrained pragmatic and morphosyntactic context is assigned grammatical function and once grammatical is assigned increasingly grammatical operator-like function. Um, so grammaticalization, although we often we speak of grammaticalization of items, most of the time uh, grammaticalization actually involve a particular morphosyntactic construction. So an item grammaticalizes from a particular morphosyntactic uh, constructions. construction. Sorry. Grammaticalization, so an item as it uh, grammaticalizes, Yes, may undergo uh, a number of changes. Uh, one change that often occurs, almost always occur, is uh, desemanticization, also called semantic bleaching. So uh, the item loses some of its lexical meaning, and of course, it gets a more grammatical meaning. Uh, an item may also undergo phonological reduction, also called erosion. Um, it may undergo various degrees of uh, decategorialization. So uh, an item loses some of the characteristic properties of the category to which it uh, belongs. It uh, may be uh, undergo context extension. So it may be used in more uh, contexts. Uh, it may lose its syntactic freedom and the construction um, which involves the item uh, undergoing grammaticalization may undergo reanalysis. So the construction may change uh, underlyingly, um, and these changes are not necessarily visible on the surface. So uh, say that we have a source construction which involves two clauses. Um, this construction may be reanalyzed. Uh, into one clause. So two clauses become uh, one clause. And of course, it's not necessarily visible uh, on the surface. Uh, so uh, we can have uh, uh, an example of uh, grammaticalization involving some of these changes. Uh, so the example is from Hein 2014, and uh, it involves the grammaticalization of the verb uh, to use as in 3A, he used all the money into um, a habitual marker, used to, as in 3B, he used to come on Tuesdays. So grammaticalized uh, used to um, has undergone desemanticization. It's a very difficult word to say for me. Uh, so it has lost some of its lexical uh, meaning. It has acquired a more grammatical meaning and aspectual one. It has undergone decategorialization, uh, so it has lost the ability uh, that all verbs in English have to be inflected. Uh, it's used to can be phonetically reduced, and uh, it's uh, used in more contexts. So used to uh, is now, no, it's not used in more contexts, but it used in, it's used in other contexts. So used to takes verbal complements rather than uh, nominal um, complements. Oops. Uh, 
Uh, yes, so um, because URAL is a motion verb and we're talking about the grammaticalization of motion verb, I thought I ought to say a little bit about the common uh, grammaticalization pathways for motion verbs. So it's very common, um, motion verbs are very common sources of grammaticalization uh, cross-linguistically and uh, they grammaticalize mostly into markers of tense, aspect, mood or modality. So very often we have verbs like go and come uh, developing temporal meanings, so they mark past, future, etc. Change of state as well. Uh, and they can also uh, very often grammaticalize to mark close level relations. So they grammaticalize into add positions, marking uh, path semantics, case markers, and very often they also grammaticalize into um, purpose uh, markers, especially go and come. And well, more rarely, cross-linguistically, on the cross-linguistic scale, uh, motion verbs can also grammaticalize into discourse uh, markers. Uh, so a lot of the time it's uh, the deictic motion verbs that undergo this grammaticalization, so the verbs like go and come. Uh, some uh, other verbs like return in Tagbailit, it also occurs in Oceanic languages, and uh, verbs meaning reach or proceed in uh, some languages. These verbs uh, grammaticalize uh, to uh, become narrative discourse markers uh, or they are also sometimes called textual connectives, consecutives or discourse connectors. Uh, but I mean, these terms mean uh, exactly the same thing. This uh, grammaticalization path is very common in African languages. So it's been reported in all uh, linguistic phyla of the African continent. It's found more sporadically in other areas and in other linguistic families. So it's found in some Oceanic languages, a couple of Turkic, Dravidian, and uh, one Romance language. It's a, a Spanish language from South America. I can't remember which one. So let's uh, briefly look at what discourse markers are. So discourse markers are generally adverbs, so things like indeed, well, after in English. They don't have to be just adverbs, but mostly they are. Uh, they are defined by Trogot as uh, categories which have their own syntactic slot and their own intonational properties. Um, their function is to mark the speaker's evaluation of relationships between sequential units of discourse, uh, particularly between the current utterance and some prior discourse. The current utterance is minimally uh, one sentence, but it can be a longer stretch of text. And the prior discourse can consist of an actual utterance or can be something that is uh, contextually reconstructed. So an inference or a pre presupposition. Uh, narrative discourse markers are a subtype of discourse markers. Uh, they are found mostly in narratives, hence the name. Uh, they mainly signal, um, they have a particular so function, mainly uh, they signal uh, that uh, there's a new event coming. So they modify uh, an event that is new uh, in the story. And uh, Hein 2000 uh, says that we can paraphrase their semantics as something like, watch out, now something new is going to happen that is relevant for what follows. So this is their main function. Um, they can also additionally, additionally mark uh, other, uh, have other meaning. So they can mark that the new event is unexpected, uh, that the new event is sudden, or that it's simply a new event that is a logical consequence of a prior event. Uh, yeah. So um, I have two examples coming uh, from a Chadic language from Kera. Uh, Kera has two uh, narrative discourse markers, both grammaticalized from motion verb. The first one is illustrated in 5a. Uh, it's uh, grammaticalized from the verb to come. Um, and uh, well, it marks, it's used by speakers 
to signal new events that are logical consequences of uh, previous events. So uh, the prior context of the previous events described is they set out to find a trap. They then set it up in the beans. So apparently, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, know, I don't understand what <laughs> this example, but apparently uh, setting up the beans is a logical consequence of uh, setting out to find the trap. Well, and uh, in B, we have an example uh, of the second uh, discourse uh, marker, narrative discourse marker. This one is grammaticalized from the verb uh, to go, and it marks that a new event is unexpected or occurs suddenly. So the context is hyena hung around chatting. Suddenly, she saw that the fish was no longer there. <laughs> Again, it's very, uh, it's unexpected that the fish is not there, apparently. Right, so now that um, the uh, background is uh, done, um, I can focus on um, oral in Tagbailit. So as I said at the beginning of the talk, uh, oral uh, canonically encodes motion, uh, and it's a written shaped uh, it's a motion with a return-shaped path, as illustrated with a different example in six. I went back to that place where I was staying. It's most often, uh, it most often encodes a motion that has a return-shaped path, but it doesn't have to encode a return-shaped path. So in some context, uh, it's just encode a uh, simple motion. So in seven, a little bit after that came one boy on a bicycle. So this is an extract from uh, one of my pair stories. Uh, and it's the first time the little boy turns up in the story, but the speaker uses uh, comeback. Um, the verb yural, when it encodes motion, uh, has the uh, property, the morphosyntactic properties typical of other verbs in Tagbailit. So it uh, usually carries uh, an agreement marker. And this agreement marker has to uh, agree with the subject NP if it is overt. So uh, Tagbailit doesn't have to have an overt subject, but if the subject is overt, then uh, the, uh, the agreement marker on the verb has to match uh, with um, the subject that is overt. Uh, the verb, like a lot of the motion verbs in Tagbailit, can also host a ventive clitic. So the role of the clitic is to direct um, the motion event uh, to the direction of the speaker. So if the event is directed towards the speaker, uh, a verb like uh, oral can be modified by the ventive clitic. The verb is uh, intransitive, and it is optionally followed by a locative or a directional complement, and this is what we have in six. Um, I went back to that place where I was say, staying, so to that place where I was say, staying is uh, a directional complement. And uh, the verbs, when it uh, encodes uh, motion, uh, can inflect for different aspects. Uh, so in the previous example, it was in the perfective. We have an example in eight, where the verb is in the imperfective. She would come back to where all the women were grouped. Now, the verb oral is also used in a certain context uh, with change of state semantics, in which case it's translated as to become. So we have an example in nine. He arrived, the poor man, he became yellow. Uh, so the verb, again, obligatorily agrees with a subject NP if there is uh, an overt subject NP, like the other you had. Um, However, it doesn't normally occur in different aspects. It usually occurs only in the perfective aspect. And because I haven't done elicitation, I don't know whether it's ungrammatical to have the verb in other aspects, but I just know that I don't find it and I've never heard it. Uh, the verb never occurs with the vantive marker and it's obligatorily followed by a copular clause, so a nonverbal clause. In um, nine, it's this thing introduced by the copular 
uh, D and the word for yellow. So this is uh, something that could be used as a clause on its own and it would mean he is yellow or it is yellow. So uh, literally what the second line of nine uh, means is he became, he is yellow. Oh. And now, grammaticize the Ural, the Ural which I think uh, is a narrative discourse marker. Uh, in 10, we have uh, the examples, uh, the examples, sorry, that I presented uh, at the beginning of the lecture. She cut the navel string and then she uh, bandaged the boy. Uh, so, grammaticized Ural does not encode event semantics, as opposed to uh, the motion Ural and the change of state Ural. Uh, it co-occurs obligatorily with another verb. This uh, other verb is the main verb of the clause. It encodes uh, event semantics and it carries the semantic load of the clause. Uh, Ural does not inflect for aspect, it's a bad way of saying it, it only inflects for perfective. So it only occurs in the perfective stem and uh, it, does not, it cannot take the ventive. It inflects for agreement and normally, the agreement marker agrees with the subject of the main verb, but it doesn't have to agree with the subject of the main verb. So in some context, I find that the verb agrees with something else, and usually that something else is um, either a, part so a participant that was mentioned in the prior context, in the previous events, uh, and maybe uh, a thematic participant of the main verb, but not its subject. So this is what we have in 11. So in 11, the verb oral here has the first person singular uh, agreement marker, but the main verb um, has a subject agreement marker, which is the third person plural feminine. Okay, so the, they don't have the, the agreement doesn't uh, match. The agreement matches the, oh, there it is the um, dative argument of the verb, okay? And I think the speaker was mentioned, I mean, she talked about herself in previous sentences just before this example as well. Uh, yes, so, um, yeah, so as I said, uh, speakers um, translate uh, grammaticized oral as meaning, uh, as having sequential semantics, so as meaning and, then, and after, but they also describe uh, other meanings and uh, sources who have focus, uh, which have focus, sorry, on um, this topic also describe uh, other meanings for grammaticized oral. So another one is, in coative aspect. So it is often described in this context as uh, marking the beginning of a new event. So start doing something. Uh, it is also uh, described as having terminative aspect semantics. So I'm translating from French. So uh, Chaker uh, translates it as uh, meaning in French, finalement, which can be translated as finally, but, and it will be interesting, I think, in, in soon, uh, but uh, I think that finally in French uh, has an unexpected meaning that finally in, in English doesn't have. So maybe that's why he translates it as uh, finally, finalement. Uh, and it's also sometimes translated as meaning going back to doing something, okay? Right, so now here's why I think that Ural uh, has grammaticalized into a narrative discourse marker. Uh, why it ha I think it might be a narrative discourse marker. So first of all, uh, the verb doesn't uh, serve to link two conjuncts. So it doesn't link just one single clause with another single clause or one event with just one other event. What it does most often is that it links sets of sentences which describe related sets of events to other sets of sentences that also describe their own uh, sets of related events. Um, I mean, I call these thematic paragraph to help me, but it's a, it's a bit different to um, the thematic paragraph in Given, so 
it's, uh, let, let's forget about that. But so the, the, the sets of sentences, uh, they can be of any size. So they can consist of just one sentence or they can consist of uh, five, six sentences. Uh, and so I have a, an example of a long um, paragraph. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so the, the, the prior context is this long paragraph. And then it's this little sentence in 13 that is linked to that whole uh, paragraph with the verb oral. So the previous uh, paragraph is so about uh, Mustafa's birth. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> it's not very glamorous, but I, I have a good example of oral, so I don't care. So the contraction started at six in the evening. My stomach was sore, it was sore, it come down, it would be sore, it would come down. So for like a whole paragraph, well, the speaker is talking about contractions. Huh? And then there's the, I fell asleep, I slept until four in the morning. So it's a, we can say a new set of events, a bit unexpected, you know. Uh, and so what Ural is doing is linking that utterance or that sentence to the whole paragraph that comes before, not just to one sentence that comes before. Uh, and then in 14, we have a little bit of how the, the story continues. So then she slept and then uh, I awoke, my tummy, my tummy, blah, 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 blah. Um, so I also think that um, Ural uh, is a narrative discourse markers because it seems to have the discourse functions uh, of narrative discourse markers. Um, so it often uh, introduces new series of events and these new events are often unexpected and sometimes it's hard to say that they are unexpected but for sure they differ from uh, what could be the default inference. So what we would expect, well yeah, so unexpected. But unexpected to me sounds very strong, but anyway. Um, they use oral also to return to a topic of conversation after an aside. Uh, they use oral to introduce a new event that's very rare uh, in uh, my corpus. So they use oral uh, to um, describe a new event that is the consequence um, or the culmination of previous events. And then there are contexts where it's hard to tell whether Ural is here because it's describing a new event or just because it has an aspect, a, a different aspectual um, function. So uh, in 15, uh, we have a, a set of sentences, so a thematic paragraph that precedes a sentence introduced by uh, Ural. So she took me and laid me down on the ground. Yes, yeah, so this is again something that happens after someone has given birth. And I don't really understand <laughs> what is the aim of these uh, actions, but th they used to be done straight after a woman had given birth. Uh, and they go together. So she took me and laid me down on the ground. She put me on my face. She walked all over me. She walked on my back. She walked all over me like this. One sat here, the other sat there. They bound me like this. Uh, and then this is the next sentence after all this. After I got up, so she doesn't say it, but it's, it's inferred. I got up. I threw away all the West. I cleaned everything. I cleaned everything, all this West. So definitely a new event. So, you know, she's getting up after whatever, these events that we don't really know what <laughs> the, the M is, what their M is, uh, but it's also unexpected. She has just given birth and then she wakes up and then she starts to tidy up everything. So she's probably marking, you know, signaling that this is um, unexpected. Uh, there's another example in 17. It's from uh, the pair stories again. I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether it marks unexpectedness here, but it could. So uh, this is just uh, she's describing the moment where the little boy steals the basket of pear in the pear story. Uh, so then he robbed one basket from him, one basket he robbed it, the other he left it empty. So again, that's, you know, it's unexpected. You don't expect to... Um, you know, have your bas basket of pears stolen. Uh, and in 18, I have an example that I took from another source. Um, so it's an example from Shaker. Uh, 
he gave it to him and he translates uh, Yuhal here as finally and he says between uh, brackets and contrary to what he had said before. So again, contrary to what was expected, finally he gave it uh, to him. Okay, so there are examples from other people also showing <laughs> that it, it may mark uh, unexpectedness. Now I have very few examples, as I said, where uh, the uh, event, it's one event uh, introduced by Ural, and it's usually linked to just one previous event, as we have in 19. And I think that here it marks that the event is a logical uh, consequence of the previous event, or it, it's the culmination of the previous event or state of affairs or whatever. So when I grew up, uh, they veiled me, they veiled me. Um, uh, I also find the verb uh, when the speaker returns to uh, the topic of conversation after they have stopped the topic of conversation to talk about something else. So I, I had a better example in my corpus, but I chose this one because it, it's shorter and it fitted on the slide. So um, the speaker is talking about where she lived when she was uh, younger with her parents, and then she starts 20, we left. Uh, and then she explains to me the war with France started, so that's why we left. And then she goes back to, we went to the conversation we left, we went to uh, Buiha, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and yes, so there are contexts where I don't know whether Ural is used here just um, as a discourse marker because it marks a new event, or because it's aspectual, it marks to start doing something. So um, these construction groups, where are they? There. Yeah, they, they're a little bit different to the previous ones because the second verb, so the verb which follows oral, is not in the perfective in those examples. It's in the auri stem preceded by this particle, and usually this construction we find in uh, infinitive clauses or purpose, uh, subordinated clauses that encode purpose, okay? Uh, so yes, yeah, so the translation of that event is, I started to call, no, 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 it's a boy, it's a boy. So it's, it's repetitive. So she called, she gave, she gave birth again. It's a different story, but it's another story of giving birth. And uh, after that, she called her eldest daughter to say it's a boy. Uh, and, but she repeated it several times that it was a boy because she was happy maybe. Um, and I have another example involving exactly the same construction. So the particle here with the verb in the aorist. Uh, so uh, the previous context is another boy went to him, another boy went to him, he lifted him, he brushed him, etc., etc. And then, after that, even him started to pick his pears. So again, this is an extract from the pear stories. So a little boy, there's a lot of little boys in, in, in this uh, particular example. So one little boy has fallen down and all his pears have fallen down. Several boys are picking up the pears and one little boy, that's the one in 20, is helping this other little boy cleaning his stuff. And then the little boy who's helping him and cleaning his stuff then starts to help him to pick up his pears also. So there's a change. You know, he was doing something. Now he's doing something else. He's picking up the pears. Uh, but um, I don't know whether it's because the event is repetitive. You're going to pick up the pears repetitively or whether it's because it's a new event. It's, it's not clear uh, to see. Right, so these are the main discourse properties of uh, Ural, grammaticized Ural. Now I would like to uh, describe some of its morphosyntactic properties. So first of all, I, uh, I'm asking the question, and this is when I don't have a lot of answers, but I have a lot of questions. So um, I, I'm asking the question of what kind of construction is the construction involving Ural plus the following ver verb. So are we dealing with uh, a multi-clausal a multi construction or a monoclosal construction. And uh, what is the, the status of um, grammaticized URAL 
uh, if we are dealing with monoclosal uh, construction. So in some examples, we have uh, evidence that the construction is monoclosal. So in 23, we find uh, the uh, verb oral with its discourse function. So that verb, we find it uh, after or kind of like embedded after uh, an adverbial clause. Okay, so when I grew up, they veiled me. So the adverbial clause is modifying the verb to veil and it precedes the ural. Um, in Tagbailit, and I think in other Berber languages, when uh, we have a multiclosal constructions which is formed from a verb plus another verb in the perfective, which is the kind of construction where we find ural most often, in those constructions we may optionally uh, include the complementizer belly, which means that. So there's two examples of that in 24A and B. So 24A, I remember that Amira left at 12 o'clock, or I remember Amira left at 12 o'clock. Okay. Um, in the oral plus verb in the perfective construction, we can never find uh, the complementizer uh, belly. So 25B, which is uh, the version of 25A, when I grew up, they veiled me with the complementizer, is uh, wrong. Um, yeah, actually, uh, 25A doesn't have when I grew up. It's just they veiled me, sorry. And uh, 25B um, shows that we cannot uh, include the complementizer there. So oral plus verb in the perfective doesn't behave like multiclosal constructions involving a verb and another one in the, in the perfective. Now there's also evidence that some constructions that involve uh, grammaticized oral are multiclosal. Um, so in Tagbailit and in a lot of other Berber languages, um, there are multiclosal constructions which involve a verb, a second verb in the aorist form. Uh, so there's an example in 27. Us, we went down to the living room to sleep. Uh, so this is a multiclosal uh, construction. And as you can see, the second verb is in the aorist and it's preceded by the particle. So it's like basically the canonical strategy to have two clauses uh, in Tagbailit is to have this particle with the verb in the uh, aorist. There's another one in 28, but we don't have to look at it. Um, and of course, as I mentioned before, there are contexts where we find oral with uh, a second verb that is in the aorist form and which is preceded by uh, the particle ad. And I'm giving the, um, I started to call Nunu, it's a boy, it's a boy example again in 29. Um, we, we've, we've looked at this example before. So I don't, I mean, these uh, recall are the constructions that are not uh, clearly uh, discursive, that, you know, they could have a, an aspectual meaning. Um, so it is possible that we are actually dealing with two different constructions involving a grammaticized uh, oral, uh, one which is uh, multiclosal, as in uh, little i, and one which is monoclosal, as in little two. The multiclosal one is when the second verb is uh, in the aorist and preceded by the particle ad, and uh, the monoclosal one is when the second verb is in the perfective. Uh, as I said before, so they seem to have different meanings anyway. Uh, in uh, the multiclosal construction, oral is partly grammaticalized, so it has undergone some semantic bleaching, so it's gone from motion to incoative aspect, it's starting doing something repetitively. Uh, it's undergone some decategorization, so it can only occur in the perfective form but it has retained some verbal properties, so it can have a closal complement, that's the ad plus v aorist. And in the second construction, oral is uh, more grammaticalized, uh, so it's gone from motion to something else, which I will discuss later, and it ended up being a discourse marker. It's undergone the categorization, so it only occurs in perfective forms. It's got a less rigid agreement, so 
the only time when I don't find the uh, agreement matching the agreement on the second verb is when the second verb is in the perfect tip. So maybe oral is more adverbial there, I don't know. And of course, I mean, the whole construction has undergone possibly some kind of reanalysis depending on what the source construction of that construction is. And um, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So now I'd like to talk about the uh, category uh, of uh, Ural when it uh, has this discourse meaning uh, and when it occurs in a monoclosal construction. Um, so motion verbs and other activity verbs in uh, Tagbalit and a lot of verbal languages, when they grammaticalize, usually they become uh, either particles or what people describe um, as uh, auxiliaries. So I don't think that Ural uh, is, uh, has grammaticalized into an auxiliary. Um, I don't think it's an auxiliary because it's the following verb that carries agreement and uh, the tense aspect mood load of the clause, uh, not oral. Uh, and verbal languages, I mean, if <laughs> technically verbal languages do not really have auxiliaries actually. Um, uh, and it's not either a tense aspect uh, mood particle. So there's a lot of tense aspect mood particles in uh, Berber languages that precede the verb, but they have um, two properties uh, that are illustrated in uh, all the examples in 31. So the first one is that these particles, they attract clitics. So clitics usually in Tagbalit and in other Berber languages, they attach to a verb. But if the verb is preceded by a tense aspect mood particle, the clitic goes on the tense aspect mood particle. So as you can see in uh, 31 here, and in uh, 31 again, so the second example in 31. Uh, and also these particles can never be separated, uh, cannot be separated from the verb by an independent word. So they can be separated from the verb, obviously by a clitic, but not by a verb that can stand on its own. So uh, the last example, after I will tell you the story where the adverb after occurs bef uh, between the particle and the verb is ungrammatical. Ural, uh, in the verb, uh, in the ural plus verb in the perfective construction, ural never attract clitics. Uh, so this is what we have in 32. The clitic has to stay uh, on the, uh, the main verb. Uh, and there are examples in my narratives, very few, but still, there are examples where uh, the verb oral is separated from the second verb by uh, the adverb uh, meaning after. So after I started to throw away all the waste. So now finally, yeah. Um, the possible sources of grammaticalization. So as I said uh, at the beginning, at some point in, towards the beginning uh, of the talk, items grammaticalize from particular morphosyntactic constructions, from particular morphosyntactic contexts. So um, there, in the literature on uh, the motion to narrative discourse marking grammaticalization path, there are three uh, scenarios proposed or three uh, morphosyntactic construction that are possible sources for this uh, development. The first one is proposed by Hein, 2000. Uh, I, call it, I don't know if I call it or if he calls it, probably he calls it the iterative uh, scenario. So according to him, um, a verb so we, a verb starts as a, you know, a motion verb, so it expresses motion. And then there's a construction in which uh, a verb um, repeats the motion encoded by a previous verb. So the motion verb becomes to express echoing motion. So not really motion in the clause where it is used, but motion that has been uh, expressed in a previous clause. And then from echoing motion, it becomes a discourse uh, connector or a discourse uh, marker. The second scenario is the futurity scenario. Uh, so it's proposed by a number of people. So according to that scenario, 
uh, sorry, we go from motion to purpose and then to future tense and then to discourse uh, marking. So discourse markers actually grammaticalize from motion verb that have themselves grammaticalized into future tense uh, markers. And the third scenario is the repetition uh, scenario. It's found in uh, some oceanic languages and it's proposed by Moïse uh, Fauri. So, and it's, it's a path that is specifically proposed for verbs meaning return or go back. So, in this scenario, uh, we start from motion and then the motion verb grammaticalizes into a repetition marker, so something marking again. Uh, and then from again, it grammaticalizes into a discourse marker. So the discourse comes from uh, the um, repetition or iteration, iteration um, meaning. Uh, so there are, I think, only two possible scenarios. Uh, the first one, there's no echoing motion in Berber, in Tagbalit, so it, it can't be the, 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 the right path. Uh, so there are two possible paths. Um, for Tagbailit Oral. So the first one is the purpose future scenario. Uh, it's possible, given that we find a, a construction where Oral is followed by uh, an add plus verb auris construction, and the add plus verb auris construction marks purpose a lot of the time. Um, it's possible, but it doesn't seem likely. It doesn't seem likely because I almost never, I mean, I never find in my corpus Ural used in a purposive construction. Never. Uh, so I never find examples like return in order to. Hmm? Uh, and also, uh, Ural does not encode future at all. There's no, um, there's no Berber language, I think, where uh, comeback, uh, Ural, has uh, grammaticalized into a marker of future. Um, so it's not the right um, scenario. Plus, uh, discourse Ural uh, precedes, well, the canonical Ural that, mean, that marks discourse uh, functions precedes most often perfective verbs than aorist verbs. Okay? When it precedes aorist verbs, we don't know whether it's, I don't know whether it's really discourse or whether it could be aspectual. And finally, it's not a, a good scenario for tagbailit oral, oral uh, because uh, so items uh, that are grammaticalized in tagbailit and in Berber that are grammaticalized from the verb plus add aorist uh, construction, they tend to incorporate the add particle. So the end form incorporates the add somehow. So an example is the future particle, uh, rad, in Tashelit Berber from Morocco. Uh, and so this form is a reduced form uh, of he wants plus add plus etc. And you see the, uh, the rad inco um, incorporates the add. Uh, Clear. So the second scenario is the repetition scenario. It's possible because some earlier sources describe a repetitive meaning for Ural. So I found one example in a dictionary from, why is it coming like this? Uh, from 1901. So uh, he went back to sleep. Uh, and so, yes, I, I, I wrote it like it was written in the dictionary. So that's why it's, it's written in a different way than I do. Uh, so here, this is Ural here, and, and Ural uh, means, um, you know, the, the, the re-beginning of a state or of a new event, I think. Uh, yeah, so it's possible, but in my data, I don't have this repetitive meaning of uh, Ural in, in my data, in my narratives. I don't find it, so, you know, I don't know. Um, so what I would like to suggest is that the source for the discourse, um, the narrative discourse marker oral, is actually the change of state construction. Okay, um, this is um, how do you say an intuition that I had um, a long time ago when I started. Uh, translating my narratives and I had this intuition before I found all the data talking about how motion verbs grammaticalize into discourse markers. So, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, 
but um, if that's the case, then we, the, okay, so the, the source of the discourse uh, marker URAL is the construction that I described at some point where URAL means uh, become, where it expresses a change of state and it's followed, sorry, not by a nominal clause, it's, it's the wrong way of describing it, by a copular clause. And the copular clause expresses a state. And then, well, possibly from there, uh, the verb URAL still means change of state to become, but then instead of being followed by a copular clause expressing a state, it's followed by a verb expressing a state in the perfective. So the reason I, I'm thinking about that is because it's very common in Berber to express uh, states or things that are expressed in English with adjectives. It's very common in Berber to express them with verbs. And to have the stative meaning, you need to have the verb in the perfective. So if you have the verb in the imperfective, then it becomes a change of state, okay? Uh, and then from there, so it's still expressing a new state, from there you have URAL with occurring with any verb in the perfective and instead of marking a new state, you mark a new event. I'm happy with that, <laughs> except that I don't have evidence for the, <laughs> the most important bit, the one in between. <laughs> it's a shame, but well, I haven't... Yeah, so possible evidence, no, actually, I, I, I thought about uh, one possible piece of evidence. Uh, it's, again, the example uh, that I found in the uh, dictionary from 1901. Um, so he went back to sleep, what he translates as he went back to sleep. So this is the verb to sleep in the perfective aspect, I think. But the verb to sleep is a stative verb in Tagbailit, at least in the dialect that I work on, it's a stative verb. So it doesn't mean he slept. Literally, it means he is asleep. So this is an example with a stative verb. So, but this is the only one <laughs> I have <laughs> to support my um, hypothesis, right? So uh, yeah, I'm done, so some conclusion. So there is evidence that the verb return or go back in Tagbailit has grammaticalized into a narrative discourse marker its main function is to link one or more new events to a series of previous events. Um, there is evidence that some of the constructions in which it occurs are monoclosal. Uh, URAL has lost most of its verbal properties but does not function as a particle or an auxiliary. It's not clear what it, its category is. Uh, the source construction for the grammaticalization in Tagbalit is not clear either. Uh, but discourse the discourse function may possibly come from the change of state construction. And I'm done. So these yeah, are the references if you're interested. Thank you. Imperfective, yeah. but they don't express a state, they express a change of state. Ah, okay. So he is becoming this. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it, in other verbal languages, it, it can have all sorts of meanings as well when you put the imperfective on stative verbs, but I can't remember now. So, so you said that the, the sleep example that was, um, it's like the verb actually means to yes. be sleep. To be asleep, yeah. Okay, so, but it, it's still in a perfective form. Yeah. Oh, okay. is, that, is that what you find weird? Yeah, in, I find that unintuitive, but maybe I'm... Maybe I'm in, 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 in Berber, it's very common okay. to have the perfective as not a change of state, a stative. Okay. So he is asleep, I don't know what else. He is wet, something like that. Yeah. Okay. So it means like he has fallen asleep, he has entered the... Is that what you mean? I don't think so. Some people, some people say that it, it maybe it's it's understood as a stative because it you know it has a change of state in it. I don't think so. Um, one reason why I don't think so is okay. It's because of the ventive clitic in verba. So the ventive clitic it doesn't just occur with um, 
verbs of motion. It can occur with different kinds of verbs. And usually, these verbs, they need to, have a, to encode a change. And all these verbs, like to sleep, that you know, are translated as stative, they cannot occur with uh, the ventive. When they occur with the ventive, it means something else. It means he slept somewhere else. He went somewhere, he slept, he came back. But I don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So I was going to go find the example, but it's taking ages. Yes? I actually had another question. Um, in, if, if you're actually, if you go to example 20, I think it was, um, there I think the, the personal number marking on, on the, on Uval was... But uh, they're different. Third person plural, yes. Yeah. Uh, but I couldn't see the third person plural in the context around there. Yeah, that's, I think it comes before she's talking about her family and... All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. yeah. So does, does it really always refer to some entity that was talked about? In my narrative, yeah. yes. Yeah. In mm -hmm. my narrative, yes. It could be, I mean, it could be a per, you know some kind of performance error, but I don't think so. It's repi it's repeated a lot. I mean, from seeing this context, I thought that it might be the, that she's talking about the, the parents or something, um, and then and then she's in the first person plural to include herself in the family. Yeah, I, I can't. I don't remember what comes just before that. Uh, maybe she's maybe maybe it's the example where I, when I grew up they veiled me, mm. uh, blah blah blah. We left. They. You know, they are in the, they, they're mentioned. Mm -hmm. So it can really go back a couple of sentences. Yeah. And she's, I mean, in, in, in previous paragraphs, she's talking a lot about her family, what yes. she needs to do for her parents, her grandmother, you know, the adults around her, she's to work around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're really there in the story. I'm curious about um, how frequent these these constructions are. Have you looked at? No, I haven't done. Thing? I haven't done a uh, sort of like. Uh, no, no, no. I haven't. The, it depends on the speaker. So all the speak. It's very frequent in uh, with all the speakers. So I've got a speaker that is, you know, uses them a lot. Um, she's monolingual, and she's older. And then I have speakers that are bilingual, they speak Arabic as well. Uh, and uh, well, they don't use them a lot. And when they use them, they use them in, uh, in the very sort of, uh, you know, it agrees with the following verb and it's uh, just a new event. And, yeah. But yeah, it's more frequent with older speakers that are monolingual. And do you notice any substrate influ influence in their Arabic that they would use? The, no, no, these, these are those that don't speak Arabic. No, but you're, you said you had bilinguals. Oh, yeah, but they don't, no, they don't use it, I mean, they don't use it that much, no. No, I haven't, no, I haven't even considered you know, influence from Arabic. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess in this example, the Uvala has um, has a third person plural marking, whereas O does not. Um, it looks like in most other examples they have the same number yeah. person. Um, is I guess overall, do, do they mostly share the same person number marking? Yes, 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 they do. I mean, I looked um, at other sources, and there is a source also uh, mentioning this uh, mismatch in agreement. Um, so I found an example where Ural is, uh, has the third person singular agreement marker and the verb following is in the third person plural feminine. Um, but then again, in Tagbali, third person singular can be the, I mean, it's also the default sometimes. So a lot of verbs that grammaticalize, you know, then they kind of like, become grammaticalized from the third person singular masculine, so. 
Yeah. As I said, I didn't do any elicitation. I wasn't working on Ural. I wasn't interested in Ural at the time. Uh, so I didn't ask a lot of questions, but um, so. So it might be that the speaker is, you know, is making some errors, but I mean, she would correct herself, right? She knows her language. It's, you have to, I mean, <laughs> some point you have to trust her. Yeah, but if your story is right and it, its function is primarily a discourse marker, then it's difficult to explore that in a dissertation. Right? You really need a yes. larger yes, discourse yes. context to be able to yes. figure out the yes. semantics. Yes. And people's intuitions will break down if you. Yeah, if you start down, asking. If you just yeah. start pulling out individual. Yeah. 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 Have you got any conversational material? I mean, I'm curious no, about not recorded. No, not, not recorded. Right. No. No. I'm sort of curious about whether, in turn taking it, you know, Ural can be used to say. Um, oh, no, it's your turn. Continuity, or, you know, having said that, you know, and then what happened? Ah, right? yes, yes. Ah, uh, yeah, well, I, then I need, I need to do some recording. Right. I need to go back. I'm just thinking of. Um, there's a Japanese construction you would say, do you do, having, you know, having said that, so you, you can use that as a prompt to, to get somebody to say in the next thing in oh, the okay. story. Or do you have any reference for the Japanese? I can find some. Okay, thank sure. you. Yeah. Yeah. That's with the verb to speak, not, not, with, a, not with a motion. But yeah, but... Yeah, that's very interesting. I'm just wondering about whether you have any specu speculations as to why younger bilinguals do not use um, um, AHAL as the uh, discourse marker. Do they use any other dis discourse markers instead? Or? No, not very much. If they, I mean, for sequentiality, uh, sometimes they use the Arabic. But it, uh, it's very rare and it doesn't, I don't think that it has the same function. The Arabic is really after. Um, but it's very rare. No, I don't know. It, 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 your question is a bit similar to uh, Peter's earlier question. I don't know whether it's uh, because it's influenced from Arabic or whether it's because, I don't know, whether they're younger and, you know, it's, uh, maybe young people don't, don't use that. Maybe it's not cool. But other people may actually create other kind of discourse markers. And yeah, I haven't, I haven't looked at, yeah. Okay. yeah. There's language shift going on, so that younger speakers are less fluent in, the, in this or not. Because one of the things that we often see across linguistically is that the first sign, the first formal structural sign <coughs> of shift is actually at the discourse level. So people, you know, oh. the, the discourses become less, yeah. you know. Well, I don't, I don't know what, what the situation is like at the moment. I haven't been uh, to Algeria for a while, but I think Tagbalik is one of the strongest verbal languages. Um, and, you know, there's a, a big region in Algeria where, uh, you know, Tagbalik is spoken as, you know, the everyday language. Um, Young people. I mean, in, in outside of uh, Kabylie, I think the young people speak Arabic uh, more often and they speak Tagbalit if they have to speak to an older member of their family, like a grandmother, a mother that doesn't speak Arabic. But amongst themselves, yes, I think they, they speak Arabic. But outside of the Kabylie region, in the Kabylie region, I have a few friends, and I, I hear them speak in, in Tagbalit amongst themselves, mm -hmm. yeah. And have you seen anything in any other Berber language that's parallel to, to this? No, I, I, no I, haven't, I haven't looked. Um, and I don't think there's a, an Ural, um, I don't think it, it, it's, I'm not sure we find it in this form in other languages. But I mean, no, I'm, I'm, 
I, I looked at uh, some some sources like uh, Kosman, you know, the grammars from Kosman. So he works on uh, some Moroccan Berber. I didn't find anything, but I didn't do like a, a very thorough search. Yeah. We should tell Mediam to keep her eyes out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Peter, can I just ask what you meant when you said it would shift and it would be the discourse? What do you mean? Yeah, so um, it, it's, uh, what, um, one of the indicators that, that you're getting shift going on is that people find it more difficult to, um, to organize and structure discourse. So, um, um, what's the name, we worked on Scottish Gaelic, Dorian talks about stylistic shrinkage as being one of the first signs of shift. So um, the range of possible construction types that you get tends to shrink yeah. and then um, the, 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 pos the possible flexibility of the language, um, alternative constructions uh, start to reduce and, and you end up with more fixed kinds of, of, of expressions. So if somebody's telling a story, it'll be you know, like the Cinderella kind of story, where we know that, you know, where we know what, what follows what and so on. Um, so Dorian suggests that the first kind of step in language loss, language shift, is stylistic shrinkage, uh, people not being able to have the full stylistic range of expression, and then eventually getting down to where they only know fixed expressions and their lexicon collapses and the grammatical system reduces. Okay. So, so then it would make sense that mm, yeah, the yeah, speaker yeah. is older than the yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And of course then you also have uh, contact effects so that um, mm -hmm. things like, uh, and I think uh, we, we see this in a number of other areas, so that stuff like uh, discourse connectives, adverbial things, get pulled in. Mm -hmm. um, so especially where if languages have, say, non-finite, <coughs> they use non-finite expressions for causal linkage, and the contact language has um, more finite constructions with linkers like, and then after that, having done that, you know, consequently, they can get borrowed borrowed in or copied in so that you get a copying of the patterns. Um, so kind of native discourse organization can then get um, affected by the, the influence of the contact language. Okay. And Dorian is a good source. If I want to read about it, you would suggest that? Well, she's the first one who identifies um, stylistic shrinkage as, a, as an example. Sorry? Interesting, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I should. I no, no, it's fine, right. actually. It's, uh, it, it was interesting. I'm glad so, that. Um, uh, just to give you an example, some of, the, some of the languages I've worked on in Australia, you could find speakers who are fluent in the sense that you ask them, how do I say this, how do I say that? They can translate perfectly fluently. Mm -hmm. And they have conversations, they talk to each other in conversation, but if you sit them down and ask them to tell a story like I just, mm -hmm. they can't do it. Mm -hmm. because, because the the genre of storytelling has, has kind of disappeared yeah. in a way. Mm -hmm. So the notion of having, you know, the style of storytelling, etc., has, has dropped out of usage. Yeah. And the, the ne sort of next step in that is then you become Word order becomes rigid, etc. Yeah, et yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought you were going to make. It looks kind like. Of, it I thought you were going to make a methodological point, which which is that to really capture, you know, to understand this. I mean, you said there's many mysteries yet, yeah. but to attempt to do that. You need discourse material. You need narrative. You need conversation. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, and simply going for translation or doing elicitation or grammar checking won't actually lead you very far. So no, no, it's sort good. of methodologically from the point of view of studying these things. Yeah, it's good to.
have narratives and not just elicitation. Even if it is pay stories. <laughs> you know what to do this summer, Aisha? <laughs> Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. I'm, 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 I, I really uh, like this uh, language shift and discourse thing. Yeah, it's uh, huh? yes, Very because cool. I see that in Chiac, you know, this sort of old French, and now it really switches to English French, and I see that you know they speak like it's so simple. Mm -hmm. So I so that's yeah. why I'm curious about what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, just the way they tell a the story, it's like you know, baby talk. <laughs> so that's nice. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Well, um, as is our usual practice, we'll head over to the um, uh, UCL Institute of Education bar. Uh, so if you'd like to join us, um, join Aisha, and have an informal conversation about things, please come along. Um, so let's thank her for. Um, Really interesting talk.